Why don't we just give that to God right now? Thank you, Jesus, for what you've already done in this place. Thank you for what you did on Sunday. And God, we're excited for what you're going to do here in this place. We want to thank you in advance for the lives that are going to be changed, for the spirits that are going to be lifted today. Lord, in your mighty name of Jesus, God, fill this place with your spirit, and with your anointing. Lord, in your mighty name we pray. Everybody said in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen. Before you be seated, I want to bring us to the word of John 11 and 43. I do want to say that I am excited to be here at South Flint Tabernacle. I am thankful for Bishop and for Pastor McGee for allowing me to be here and for my pastor, Brother Gothier, for allowing me to be here tonight and to have my wife with me. Most of you know who she is, but I am blessed to have her by my side tonight. And I know that God is getting ready to do something. God is getting ready to do something tonight. Who here believes that someone's going to walk out of this place filled with the Spirit of the Holy Ghost like they've never received before? Who believes that there's going to be someone refilled with the Spirit of the Holy Ghost tonight? I'm telling you, if there's a spirit of expectation, God moves quicker. So that means that I'll get done preaching quicker. So why don't we jump to John eleven forty three? 43. I'm going to read to verse 44. It says, when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. In verse 44, it says, the man who had died came out in his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said, th- said to them, unbind him and let him go. Tonight, I want to talk to us about your Lazarus moment. One more time, why don't we just thank God for allowing us to be in this place tonight. Thank you, Jesus. We glorify you, God. We ask you to move in this house. Amen. You may be seated. How many of us know... That when we call on God, He answers. He answers. Now, it's human nature for us to, to, to feel that way, but then to also feel like He should do it on our timeline. It's human nature for us to say, oh, well, God's going to move in my life, but He's going to do it this time and this time and this time, and that's just, that's just not how He works. When, when we call on God, we think that He should do exactly what we say He should do when we want Him to do it. And that's how we think he should work sometimes. But if that were the case, then he truly would not be God. We sometimes think that if we ask God for something, we should receive the answer to our request on our specific timeline. Once there was a young boy who had gone to school for the day, and for lunch in his Spider-Man lunchbox, he had a ham sandwich and a bag of Lay's chips, and he he had an apple for dessert. One of his friends showed up to school and sat across from him with a very similar lunch, but for his dessert, he had an apple pie. And he said, wow, that looks tasty. Has everybody ever seen an apple pie just makes your mouth water? You just see that dessert and you're just like, I don't even know if I can get to the main course. I got to get dessert right now. Well, he was seeing this and he, and he said, How, how'd you get that? How'd you get the apple pie? And he said, well, my mother made it from the apples that we have in our apple tree. And his friend happily exclaimed this, so the boy sat in awe at the idea of having his very own apple tree. You're telling me I could have apple pies every day of the week if I wanted to? He was thinking this over, and he took one of the seeds from his own apple, and he said, you know what, I'm going to stick this in my pocket and save it for later, and he stuck it inside uh, inside of his jeans pocket, and once school had let out, he had made it home, and he quickly ran outside to begin his own little orchard. So he could have, so he too could have a delicious apple pie. So he buried that seed that had hung out in his pocket all day, probably covered in lint. But he decided to, you know, be his own little Johnny Apple seed. And he walked in to his mother and he said, Mom, don't worry. He assured her that they were going to be able to have apple pies for every single meal because he soon would be the proud owner of an apple tree. But the next day after school, he ran to the backyard, but to his dismay, There where he had planted the seed, there wasn't a tree. There wasn't a tree. He went to his room in tears, wondering why his attempt at being a young little Johnny Appleseed had failed. 
days and weeks pass, and eventually he had forgotten completely about the apple tree and had attempted to plant one. But one day, he got home, and he opened the door to their house, and the whole house smelt of a warm aroma. And he ran into the kitchen with his lunchbox, dropped it on the floor, didn't even put it on the counter. And when he saw in the wi- what he saw in the window over the sink, there sat a fresh, out-of-the-oven apple pie. And he ran to his mother, did, did the tree that I planted grow without me knowing because it's still not there? And, and she, she said, what, your, your apple tree? I completely forgot about that. No, I got these apples from the store today. And she, she told him this, and he, he just stood there, just his mouth wide open. Are you telling me we could have gone and got these apples this whole time? He said, but I thought you would need a tree. And his mom looks at him and just smiles and says, I've been able to do this this entire time. All you had to do was be patient. Sometimes we can be just like this boy. We have something that we want or we have something that we need and we ask God for it. But really, we don't just want it, but we want it on our timeline. We want it to work in our time. And we feel like we know best and ask God for something, but God is wanting us to be patient and have faith in who he is. David said it well in Psalms 27, 14. It says, wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. And he repeats it, wait for the Lord. If it wasn't important, he wouldn't have said it twice. I know it's difficult because it's not human nature to just be like, okay, well, I'll be patient and I'll let God work it out whenever he needs to, whenever he wants to, and just hope that eventually it happens. But he's telling us right here, wait for the Lord. Be strong. Let your heart take courage. Because when God says he's going to do something, when God says and promises you that he's going to fulfill, he always does. There's never been a time where God has said, I'm going to do something and just completely forgets about it. But if you trust in God and you trust his word, he will always fulfill his time and in his way. You see, God's timing is rarely our timing. And I'm thankful that that's not the case because his timing is perfect in every single way. We look at our main text and we see God testing the patience of his people. It says, now a man named Lazarus was sick, and he was from Bethany, the village of Mary and his sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same who had poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet, wiped her, wiped his feet with her hair. This also, just so we know, was the same Martha and Mary that Jesus had spent time in their house with. He, he had come over and hung out with them. They, they were friends. They were friends. They fellowshiped with one another. In verse 3 it says, So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. You see, they were, they were playing on the heartstrings of Jesus right there. They were trying to entice him and say, One of your friends is sick. You, you better come quickly. It's, it's someone that you've spent time with. It's one of your close friends. And they were trying to play on the heartstrings of Jesus. And it, it's, it's just like humankind to try and bargain with God. God, you said that you love me. God, your word says that you'll always be there for me. But but we forget that he also says that he works it out in his timing. That we need to wait on the Lord. You know, we'll say that that we that you you'll never leave me or forsake me. I'm a child of God, so you better get here fast. But I'm glad that he doesn't work on our own bargains with him. In verse 4 it says, when he heard this, Jesus said, This sickness will not end in death. That right there should have been enough. This sickness will not end in death. That's the answer. There it is. And it says, no, it is for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. He may be telling you, I'm going to work in your life. And you're going to say, well, do it right now. But he's saying, just wait. Just wait, I'm about to do something you can't even imagine. What you think I can fix right now is just small. I'm getting ready to do something so much bigger, so much greater. 
You see, pay, a clo- pay close attention to these next two verses. It says, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he ran right away and went, to, went and took care of Lazarus. No, that's, that's not what the Scripture says. It says that he, he, he heard that Lazarus was sick. The people that he loved, the person that he loved was sick. And he stayed where he was for two more days. For two more days. You see, Jesus loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. So he came, we, we, we want to think that he came running as soon as they called for him, but Jesus loved them. So he, he, he decided, you know what? I'm going to let them wait. He loved them enough to make them wait. But we, we think, Lazarus is sick. Why wouldn't you want to heal him now? The one you love is sick. Well, you, you could take care of it right now. You're the one who has healed the blind eyes. You have raised the lame and, and helped them to walk. Why couldn't you do this and help the Lazarus who is just sick? Sometimes we don't realize it, but God is loving us enough to make us wait on our miracle. You may think you deserve your miracle right now, but God's saying, you need a little more time. You need a little more cultivating. You need a little more maturing before I can give you what you can't even hold right now. You see, I'm about to give you something that right now you cannot hold, but eventually you're going to go through some stuff that's going to strengthen you so that you can come out the other side holding on to this miracle, and people are going to see what I've done through you, and they are going to be blessed. Your family is going to be blessed. Those that you love are going to be blessed. God is getting ready to do something in your life. All you have to do is be patient and let it work its way around. God will fulfill his word every single time. That's a foreign concept to us. God loves us enough to make us wait. He loves us enough to make us wait. That sounds so foreign. That's that's why we're not God. That's why we're not, we're, we're not keyed in on everything that he knows because only he has the answers. After two days, we see in the next verse that Jesus tells his disciples that it was time to go. It says, and, and he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. And in verse 11, skip down to verse 11, it says, after he said this, he went on to tell them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. That's powerful. That's powerful. You see, Jesus had already known that the miracle was going to happen. He had a predetermined miracle ready for Lazarus. But we see here that the disciples aren't that bright. It says, and his disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get better. If he sleeps, he'll get better. And Jesus had been speaking of his death, obviously, but his disciples thought that he meant natural sleep. And so he told them plainly, because they weren't very smart, he said, Lazarus is dead just so you know, flat out. Lazarus is dead. And he told them this, and for your sake, he tells them, "I for your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. But let us go to him. And Jesus came and he found Lazarus, who had already been in the tomb for four days. For four days. You see, Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and it says, And many of the Jews who had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother, so that when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house, and Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, if you had only been here, then my brother would not have died. You see, Martha started blaming Jesus because her patience was getting too thin. She wasn't, she wasn't willing to wait anymore, and she went and immediately started accusing Jesus. May I remind you that Jesus had spent time with Martha and Mary. This future miracle that's about to happen probably wasn't the first miracle that they were going to see. This probably wasn't the first time that they saw God work. And so why... Why would they doubt Jesus? You see, he knew them well, and they knew him. They knew what Jesus could do. They knew who he was and had faith enough to call on him while Lazarus was sick. So why wouldn't they have faith enough to call on him while he's dead? 
You see, when we lose patience and we stop, we stop waiting on God, we start to forget what He can do and what He's done in our lives. We start to forget the miracles that He has done in our lives. Yes, He may have brought me through some valleys. Yes, He may have brought me through some struggles, but He's not helping me right now, so that's just in the past. Whatever. He's not helping me right now with my present problem. You start to forget about who Jesus is, but Jesus is there to remind you. He's saying, if you just wait on me, if you just wait on me, I'm working it out. If you just wait on me, you, what, what the miracle that you thought I was going to do, that you wanted me to do, I'm about to do something greater. How many did you guys have received the Holy Ghost on, on Sunday? Three? That's just the beginning. You see, that's, that's, that's the beginning of the miracle. What God is getting ready to do, what God is getting ready to pour out, is going to be so much greater. I'm talking du- double digits when we're talking about God. We can't, bind, we can't bind God by our own expectations, but we have to trust in Him and His ability to reach the lost, His ability to fill those who are seeking with His Spirit. Turn to your neighbor and say, someone's getting the Holy Ghost. Turn to your neighbor and say, someone's getting baptized. It is going to happen tonight. It is going to happen tonight. We see that Martha had just ran to Jesus, he said, and she said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And in, we, we can get so focused on, our, on, our, on getting our miracle in the time frame that we want God to work in that we all of a sudden treat God like a stranger. And it says, but even now I know, this is Martha talking, but even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. So that's a double-sided, that's double-sided thinking because she's saying, you, if you would have been here, he would not be dead, but I still trust you, I guess. I still trust you, maybe. And Jesus said to her, just immediate reassurance, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection of the last day. And Jesus said, I am the resurrection. I am the resurrection. The one you've been waiting for is right here. You may think your miracle may be millions of miles down the road, but guess what? Jesus is here in this place right now. You may think you've got to be a certain age before you can receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, but I'm telling you, He is here right now looking for you, looking for somebody who has faith, who believes that they can receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, who believes that God is willing to give them that wonderful gift. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter where you've been, where you're from. It doesn't matter how down you may seem. Lazarus was as down as it gets. Lazarus was as down as it gets. Jesus tells Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Whosoever believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. He's talking about repentance. He's talking about repentance tonight. If you say, I'm not going to do those things anymore. I'm not going to be that person anymore. God, forgive me for being the person that I was. Forgive me for my old sins. Tonight is the night where I turn around and I go towards you. The resurrection is here. The life is here. It says, and everyone who believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? He was asking her, do you believe this? You see, he was reintroducing himself to her because she treated him like a stranger. He was reintroducing himself to her. God is looking to reintroduce himself to some people tonight. It it may have been a while since you've been here. It may have been a while since you've entered through these doors and heard truth. But I'm telling you right now, it doesn't matter how long you've been gone. 
he's ready to reintroduce himself to you tonight. He's ready to reintroduce himself and say, hey, you are still my child. You are still the one that I died for. You are still the one that I give redemption to. Even though you feel like you don't deserve it, he still gives that redemption, and he still wraps his arms around you. You may say, but I was so low. I was so wrong. I did too many things against you, God. But guess what? He's always ready and willing to reach, meet you here, to meet you and to grab you and hold you and say, I'm welcoming you back into my family. Because though we may feel like it, he never stopped loving us. Martha and Mary may have felt like, oh, well, he just doesn't love Lazarus anymore. But Jesus was still coming. He was still on his way. He was still going to prove himself, hey, I still love you. Hey, I'm still going to raise you out of that dark place. And he's going to do that to some people tonight. Tonight is a night of redemption. And she, after he reintroduces himself, after he's reminding her, hey, I love you enough to forgive you. I love you enough to redeem you. She says to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. You see, this next scripture is the shortest scripture in the Bible, but it's so powerful. Jesus weeps. Jesus weeps. Jesus weeps. We see this because it's a reaffirmation. He reintroduced himself to her, and she had faith. She immediately had faith. You see, when that, that was a form of rejoicing. That was a form of rejoicing when she said exactly who, what she needed to. A reminder to him that, yes, Lord, I, I, I believe that you are the Christ. You are the Son of God who is coming into the world. And he rejoiced. Sometimes we see that as just Jesus weeps, but maybe it was tears of joy. Tears of joy. It says, when she, when she had said this, he, she sent and called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher is here and he's calling for you. And when he heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. And now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. And the Jews who were with her in the house considering her saw Mary rose quick, rise quickly and go out. And they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet. She fell at his feet saying to him, Lord, if you had been here. You see, Martha probably, she's, she was the one who ran to Jesus first. Martha probably spreaded some doubt in the family. Because when, when you don't get your miracle in the time that you think you should, and you start to let doubt set in, it can affect those around you. You may not realize it, but if you have, a, if you have issue with your pastor, parents, if you have issue with your pastor and you're fine at church, but you go home and talk bad about your pastor, talk bad about your leadership behind closed doors and your kids hear it, my father was a pastor. And I know for a fact that there are some people who would, in, in my presence, talk bad about my father, talk bad about him as a pastor, and then they would go home and spread those same things. And I watched as those kids never had reverence for the pastor in their life. So when it came down to it, when they were looking to get married, they didn't, they didn't talk to the pastor for relationship advice. They didn't talk to the pastor, hey, can you pray for me because I'm, go I'm going through something in life. They never did that because they never developed a reverence for the pastorship. That's a whole other sermon for a whole other time. But I think it's important to notice that when Martha started doubting Jesus... Mary started doubting Jesus, and she repeated the exact same words that Martha said, and she, she, Mar Martha wasn't around. Martha wasn't around, so Mary had heard this somewhere. She said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come out with her also weeping, he was deeply moved, and his spirit was greatly troubled. 
And he said, where have you laid him? He's just ready to get to it. You know what? These people have, have, have heard too much doubt. They have heard too much, so, too much hearsay about the situation, and I'm ready to perform this miracle. And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him? But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? When we talk about that earlier, they, sh- they should have just realized, oh, well, he's about to make sure he's not dead anymore. He, he did that. He raised those from who, who were lame their whole life, who couldn't, who couldn't walk, who couldn't see, and he healed them. He was getting ready to do something that they hadn't even precedent, that they haven't even thought about. Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb, and it was a cave, and the stone lay against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. And they were thinking, oh, is he, is he really just mourning? Is he just, is he just wanting to mourn closer to Lazarus? And, and, and they say, take, he says, take away the stone. And Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he had been dead four days. Martha had already been told that he was not going to be dead anymore. Martha had already been told that her, that her miracle was about to happen, and yet the doubt that she had, that had filled her house with was still affecting her. And she said, Lord, by this time there be an odor, for he had been dead four days. And Jesus said to her, did I not tell you? I'm so glad that Jesus takes the time to remind us, to remind us of the miracle that he has promised us. Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted his eyes and said, Father, I thank you. He began with reverence. I thank you, and you have heard me. I knew that you were always hear me, and I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe, that everybody else may believe that you have sent me. And he said these things, and he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Lazarus, come out. Somebody in this place, receive the Holy Ghost. Somebody in this place, get baptized. You see, Jesus was calling out the miracle before anybody else thought or knew what was going to happen. And he calls out the miracle and he says, Lazarus, come out. And we see in the next verse, the man who had died came out in his hands and feet bound with linen strips, his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to him, unbind him and let him go. You have allowed yourself to get bound by so many things, by so many things that the world has tried to throw on you, that the enemy has tried to bring you down with. And the Lord is saying, unbind that person. It's time to be redeemed. Unbind that person. They're no longer in that darkness. Unbind that person. I'm filling them with my spirit today. God is getting ready to do something in this place that you cannot even comprehend. If the musicians would come. I didn't want to take too much time tonight because I know that God's getting ready to do something. God's getting ready to move in this place. There was an opportunity for someone in this place to have your Lazarus moment. Your Lazarus moment may be an opportunity to be saved. We're going to bring people up here. If you, if you in this place, you may all stand. I'm getting close to being done. If in this place... You have not received the gift of the Holy Ghost. Tonight is the night. Tonight is the night. You may have been trying over and over and over again, but God was just preparing you. Now, tonight is the night that you're going to walk out of here and you're going to have redemption. You're going to walk out of here and filled with the best gift you could ever receive. It can happen tonight. That's right. That's right. You see, we're a week away from from Christmas, and there are going to be a lot of gifts given that day. There's going to be a lot of things passed around, just material stuff, but something that's going to be given tonight is so much greater than anything that this world can offer you. So much greater than anything that this world can offer you. 
you can walk out of here saved. Isn't, doesn't that sound great? You can walk out of here saved. But how do we do this? How do we do this? Well, we see in Acts 2, 37, it says, Now when they heard this, talking about the death of Jesus, talking about when, when he died on the cross and he, he went into the grave and he was born again, or he was resurrected, we see here it says, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And then we have the answers right here. And Peter said unto them, Repent. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of what? In the name of Jesus Christ. You will never find anywhere in the, else in the Bible that they baptized in any other way. So if you've been baptized in another way, tonight's the night to get that fixed. And if you don't think it's biblical to rebaptize, we saw where Paul rebaptized the, the those who were who had followed John the Baptist, and he, he he said, You need to be rebaptized in the name of Jesus. And it says, Be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And how do we receive the gift of the Holy Ghost? With the evidence of speaking in other tongues. Now, that's not a language that you know. That's not a language that you've practiced. That's not something that you just come up with on the spot. But when you're praising God and you're saying, Lord, I'm no longer going to be the person that I used to be. I'm turning away from those things that I once did, and I'm, turn, I'm making a 180, and I'm headed towards you. When you start to do that, you just tell God how much you love him. You just say, Lord, thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for the love that you've shown to redeem me. You have proven that you are the resurrection and that you are the life. When you start to worship and you start to praise God, and, and you start to feel something, you start to feel a tingling on the edge of your tongue, and you start to feel that, I've heard it explained as that's just God knocking on the door. That's just him saying, let me in. Let me in. The Bible says that the tongue is the most unruly part of the body. And so don't be freaked out when you lose control of it because you already didn't have control. But when you start to speak in that other tongue, you're surrendering the one thing you have no control over. And you're saying, God, take hold. And then you start to speak in that heavenly language. You start to speak in that heavenly language, and then God just enters into your life, and he's making himself at home, and he's saying, I want to fill you with the best gift that you could ever receive. It can happen tonight. May I remind you, that's the way to be saved. That's the way to have redemption. That's the way to be set free from bondage of sin. When you go down in those waters, when you go down and you come back up, you're a different person. Every sin that you've, all, that you've ever committed, you go down in the water and your, your slate is completely wiped clean. You start to say, but I did this and I did this. And God goes, I don't know what you're talking about. Your sins are as far as the east is from the west. I have no clue what, you, what past you're talking about because I have forgiven it. Tonight in this place, I want everybody to come to the front. Make a little bit of room because we're about to do some great things tonight. God is about to do some great things tonight. If you have not received the gift of the Holy Ghost and you want to receive the best gift you could ever receive, the best thing anybody could ever give you, I want you to come up to the front. We're going to pray with you. We're not going to make you feel uncomfortable, but we want you to be filled with that great, wonderful gift. We want you to be filled with his spirit tonight. So this front is open. We have ministers ready to pray with you. If you want to get baptized, I'm sure they have robes ready. I heard that thing kick on while I was preaching. God's getting ready to do something in this place. He's getting ready to forgive some sins. He's getting ready to fill some hearts. He's getting ready to fill some people with his spirit tonight. He's getting ready to do some stuff that you have never seen done in your life. So right now, if you have not received the gift of the Holy Ghost, I want you to make your way up to the front. I want you to make your way up here, and we're going to pray for you. We are going to pray with you that God fills you with his spirit.